Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another Lord's day that thou hast given us. It's all our manifold blessings to us. We thank thee for thy word. Thank thee for thy servant, Martin Luther, whom thou didst raise up 500 years ago to bring the church back to the gospel. We pray for a mighty working in this day in which we live of the same Holy Spirit to bring us back again to the gospel of justification by faith. We pray that thou hast now enlighten us, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Galatians 5. Verse 7. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Verse 10. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. So, we have been looking at verse 9 for the past couple of weeks or so. And do you see, once again, the amazing uh, nature of the gospel? Do you see the relationship between Galatians 5, 9 and Psalm 1? Tom, do you see it? Yeah, um... The relationship is that we walk in the counsel not of the ungodly, and if you have a little leaven in your lump, then you destroy the gospel and you are ungodly. Right. To walk in the counsel of the ungodly is to sense this leaven. Well, what does leaven refer to, Ethan? What do we say? Right. It's false doctrine. And here's the principle. And that is, just as with leaven, uh, you put a little bit of leaven into the uh, dough, and what percentage of it rises? Jade. What percentage of it? All of it. Now, if you put more leaven in, it'll rise higher, but it doesn't increase the percentage. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't increase the percentage. It increases the level of rising. But a little leaven still makes the dough rise 100 Every part of the dough. That's the principle we're, we're dealing with. Contrary to what Baptists think, because Baptists view everything compartmentally. Um, if a person only goes for universal atonement, then what does that mean? What's the influence of that? Owen. If he only goes for universal atonement, what does that mean? He believes that faith reconciles himself to God or, or a work of some sort. Yeah, but what, but what I'm... My, the, the, my question is that you cannot believe in universal atonement and that not affect everything. If you believe in universal atonement, then you can't believe that Christ saves anybody if he merely makes the salvation of all men possible and so forth. If you, if you only go for God loves everybody, then what are the ramifications of that, Ethan? Uh, to deny uh, election and to say that God loves everyone, that's to destroy the whole nature of the gospel. You can't believe in hell, right? If God loves everybody and God changes not, He's always going to love. And, and when we speak of love, we're, spoken, we're speaking and we're always speaking of soteriological love, salvific love. So let's look at Luther, where we left off last, last time. Uh, 
I love this section. In philosophy, a small fault in the beginning is a great and a foul fault in the end. So in divinity, one little error overthroweth the whole doctrine. Wherefore, we must separate life and doctrine. From, wait a second. This is... No. We ended at... Uh, I just recall that was the time before. We ended at um, this paragraph. Didn't we, did we not? But we protest. Is that right? But we protest. This is about three or four paragraphs before the next heading, which is, I have trust in you through the Lord. But we protest that we desire nothing more than to be at unity with all men. Isn't that interesting? Same thing as us. What are we accused of? Gary. Being what? Uh, we're accused of being hyper-Calvinist. Being divisive. Being divisive. See? What does Luther say? Right. We, pro we desire nothing more than to be at unity with all men so that they cleave unto the doctrine of faith entire and uncorrupt. If we cannot obtain this, in vain do they require charity of us. What's he saying? Larry, do you got that? You have that? No, please explain. And listen to it again. We protest that we desire nothing more than to be at unity with all men so that they cleave unto the doctrine of faith entire and uncorrupt. If we cannot obtain this, which is to say, if we cannot be at unity with all men, in vain do they require charity of us. In other words, they require us for the sake of unity to compromise the doctrine. Why is that not possible, Larry? Because the doctrine is the basis of our unity. So what they're doing is they're at they're requiring of us for the sake of unity. That's that's sort of like saying for the sake of the house we're going to knock out the foundation. Well, if you knock the foundation, there is no house. If you knock out the foundation for unity, there is no unity. That's what Luther's saying. A curse it be that charity which is preserved through the loss of the doctrine of faith. What does he mean, the doctrine of faith? Ethan. Uh, the doctrine of justification by faith. Exactly. To the which all things ought to give place. Be it charity, an apostle, or an angel from heaven, etc. Therefore, when they make this matter of so little account, what matter of so little account? Tom. When they make this matter of so little account, what matter? The importance of justification. Exactly. How are they making it of so little account, Gary? Because they turn around and add works to it. Yeah. They're requiring unity apart from it. Apart from it. When that's the only basis for unity. They do sufficiently witness what store they set by the word of God. In other words, they're throwing the word of God out the window. Which if they did believe to be the word of God, they would not so trifle with it. They would not pretend that there is unity without the basis of the gospel, but would hold it in high honor and without any disputing or doubting would put their faith in it, knowing that one word of God is all and all are one. You see what he's saying? This is beautiful stuff. One word of God is all and all are one. Ethan, what's he saying? Uh, he's saying that their uh, willingness and uh, readiness to throw out the doctrine uh, shows their disesteem for the whole of the scripture. For one scripture is 
uh, an expression of the whole, and all of Scripture together is but one word, and that's what we've been saying, is that the Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Exactly. Likewise, they would know that one article of doctrine is all, and all are one, so that if one is set aside, he's fleshing this out here, so that if one article is set aside, then by little and little, all are lost. For they are joined, the one to the other, and are bound up together, as it were, by one common bond. Let us suffer then, therefore, to extol charity and concord as much as they list. But on the other hand, let us magnify the majesty of the word and faith. Look at uh, Ephesians 4, verse 3. Um, oh, and read that. Ephesians 4, 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, what does he mean by the unity of the Spirit? Uh, doctor. Well, but... What I'm, what, what I'm getting at is why the word spirit. What he means is the unity. This is a genitive of source. The unity which has its source in the spirit. The unity which is produced by the spirit. And how does the spirit produce unity? By getting us to love one another. How does the, unity, how does the spirit produce unity, Gary? basis of doctrine. Yeah, causing us to believe the same thing. That's the only unity that exists. Now listen, beginning with verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. See what he's saying? The unity. One aspect. Total depravity. If you believe in total depravity, you believe in unconditional. If you believe in total depravity, you believe in limited. If you believe in total, you believe in irresistible. If you believe in total, you believe in the person version of the same. If you deny one of them, the whole thing falls down. That's what he's saying right here, Paul. One body, one spirit, you're calling, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. There's election right there. Charity may be neglected in time and place without any danger. What does he mean by that? Let's read the rest of the sentence first. Charity may be neglected in time and place without any danger. But so cannot the word and faith be. Yes, you can compromise on that. And we've got to explain what he means by that. In, a, in, a, in, a, in one sense, it's not possible. But we have to explain in what sense he's talking about. Charity suffereth all things, giveth place to all men. Contrarywise, faith suffereth nothing, giveth place to no man. You can, under certain circumstances, you can refuse to be uh, polite. See what he's saying? Under certain circumstances, you can refuse politeness. But you can never refuse to hold fast to the doctrine of the truth, to the doctrine of the gospel. You see what he's getting at, Ethan? Yeah, and I think it's kind of ironic that he says it may be neglected in time and place without any danger. Um, because Luther himself uh, neglected charity in the aspect of the Swiss reformers, as we mentioned previously, and that he wouldn't tolerate them because of their views on the sacraments. Yeah. But we're speaking about the gospel. What he's talking about is, well, let's go to, uh, I don't think I even wrote this verse down. I can't remember. I was, going, I was going to write it down. How come I missed it? Zechariah 8, 19. Is 
Zechariah 8. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace. Okay, so you got two kinds of peace. You got truth, peace, and peace, truth. <laughs> truth, peace, and peace, truth. All right, what, 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 what's the kind that most people want? Jade, you follow me? Love the truth and peace. You got to find what's the relationship between the two? Do most people want truth, peace, or do most people people want peace, truth? Peace, truth. Right. Peace, truth. The kind of tr truth, right? The kind of truth that leads to smoothing the waters over. See? But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about truth, peace. In other words, what? Owen. Truth, peace is what? Uh, fellowship in the truth. Exactly. That's the only true peace there is. But peace, truth. Basically what we're dealing with in the nation right now is because they're sacrificing this very same thing. But we don't, we don't, uh, we're not, we're apolitical. But we're talking about the gospel. Charity in giving place, in believing, in giving, and forgiving is oftentimes deceived. What's he saying? See? Hey! We're deceived sometimes. We're nice to people. We think somebody's somebody other than what they were, what we'd later find them out to be. Charity in giving place and believing and giving and forgiving is oftentimes deceived, and yet notwithstanding being so deceived, it suffereth no loss, which is to be called true loss indeed, that is to say, it loseth not Christ. So if you're nice to somebody, you later find out uh, they, 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 they were a heretic, they parted from the, departed from the truth, it loseth not Christ. Therefore, it is not offended, but continueth still constant in well-doing, yea, even towards the unthankful and unworthy. Contrary wise, in the matter of faith and salvation, when men teach, when men teach lies and errors under the color of truth, and seduce many, here hath charity no place. What's he saying, Tom? Can you repeat that, please? I, oh, this listen to listen to what he says. Contrary wise, now he's talking to me. He was talking about love. Now he's talking about doctrine. On the other hand, in the matter of faith and salvation, when men teach lies and errors under the color of truth and seduce many, here hath charity no place. What is he saying? Uh, it sounds like he's saying there's no charity in good works without the foundation of doctrine. Oh, he's saying this. When people oppose the gospel... And how did he say? Under the color of truth. He's talking about Calvinists. When people oppose the gospel under the color of truth. Don't be nice to those guys. It's exactly what David said in Psalm 139. Do not I hate them, O Lord. Psalm 139. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. I count them mine enemies. Though they're not mine, they're yours. Search me, O God, and try me know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. That's the idea. He's getting across. For here... We lose not any benefit bestowed upon the unthankful, but we lose the word, faith, Christ, and everlasting life once we compromise the truth. Wherefore, if thou deniest God in one article, thou hast denied him in all. 
what we were just saying. For God is not divided into many articles, but is all in each, several, one, and one in them all together. Therefore, let us always answer the sacramentarians, sacramentarians the, the Romanists, which accuse us of neglecting charity with this proverb of Paul. A little leaven. Leaven at the whole lump, see. Accusing him of lacking charity. And what's his answer to them in, in essence, Ethan? Uh, his answer is that if you overthrow one doctrine, you overthrow the whole of Scripture. So we're not going to let it in. That's what he said. You accuse me of being uncharitable because I don't give in on this denial of whatever it is, total depravity. Play not with a name, faith, or the eye. These things have I spoken at length to confirm our people and to teach others who perchance are offended by our constancy, not thinking that we have sure and weighty reasons for it. We have reasons for being so-called unkind and uncharitable. Let it not move us, therefore, that they urge so much the keeping of charity and concord. For whoso loveth not God and his word, it is no matter what or how much he loveth. I love that. <laughs> what a statement. <laughs> For whoso loveth not God and his word, it is no matter what or how much he loveth. Gary, what's he, what's he saying? <laughs> He's saying that, <clears throat> that if you don't have a love for God, and doctrine, the word, then your love is for naught. It's yeah. not. It's not love. Yeah. It's hatred. If you don't love God and the word, it's all a show. You love yourself, and that's all. Paul, therefore, by this sentence, admonisheth as well te as well teachers as hearers to take heed that they esteem not the doctrine of the teachers as hearers. What do we say today? In Proverbs thirteen twenty. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a command, uh, what is it? Proverbs 13, 20. Uh, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. Yeah. But he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. You see the antithesis, didn't we? Yeah, we brought that up, didn't we? We brought that out, um, was that in the message or afterwards? 1 Corinthians uh, uh, one thirty. He that with walketh, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, which leads to, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, which leads to righteousness, which leads to, which is justification, which leads to sanctification, which leads to the final stage of salvation, redemption, which is glorification. If you walk with wise men, then you'll be wise. And what do we say that entails? To walk with wise men. Where? To the grocery store? Gary. No, in the fellowship of the church. Exactly. In the fellowship of the church. In the yeah. fellowship of the church. To walk with wise men. But a companion of fools. Hey. You walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You're going to stand, you're going to stand in the way of sinners. You're going to develop, develop a viewpoint. And then you will finally sit in the seat of the scornful. You'll attack the truth. And finally be destroyed. So Paul therefore by this sentence admonisheth as well teachers as hearers. The hearers, what's the difference? Admonishes teachers as well teachers as hearers. What's the difference? Ethan, how is he admonishing teachers and how is he admonishing hearers? Yeah, there are those in the church who have uh, gifts of teaching and explaining things to others, but it is incumbent just as much as upon them to uh, take heed, to take and uh, pay close attention to the doctrine, uh, in order that we might uh, convey it better to others. So it's, it goes for those who are 
teaching the word just as much as those who are hearing the word. So no, he's basically, saying, Luther is preaching to himself and to the people. He's saying, you better be sure what you're preaching is the truth. Because without the truth, there is no love. Love apart from the truth is hatred. Truth is the basis for love. And the same thing, and that's the teachers. How about the hearers? Be, take heed, therefore, how you hear. Luke 8. What is it? Luke 8, 18, right? Read that. Owen, Luke 8, 18. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. Wow, what a beautiful statement, right? Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. What is he talking about? Make sure you listen with your left ear instead of your right ear. <laughs> Is that what he's saying? Oh, wait. Huh? No. What's he saying? It, 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 this reminds me of... How many times have you heard this? People say... Somebody's preaching an error, an insidious error, a very deceitful, subtle error. And you point it out. And this is what they say. Well, what I think he meant was... Huh? What I think he meant was... Gary, what's wrong with that? There's, there's really no discernment in what was said. They don't... They don't the, the, they're tacitly admitting that there was error. Okay? They say, no, I don't think he said that. See, that's another, that's a different situation altogether. But in this situation, they say, what I think he meant was, oh, wait a second. If he didn't mean what he said, why didn't he say what he meant? And if you're a preacher of the gospel, you better mean what you say. I mean, well, you always do mean what you You better, when you get up to preach, you better be sure that the grammatical content of your message conveys what you want to convey. Otherwise, sit down and shut up. You've got no gift of preaching. That's what he's talking about. Take heed, therefore, how you hear, because they insinuate lies into the truth. You got to listen carefully. Ecclesiastes 5 1 is the same thing. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. In other words, it's be it's be it's it would be better not to go to church than to go to church and not pay attention to what's going on. Paul, therefore, by the sentence and admonish Jesus as well teachers as hearers to take heed that they esteem not the doctrine of faith as a light matter. Justification by faith again, as Ethan said. As a light matter, wherewith they may dally at their pleasure. It is a bright sunbeam. I love this illustration he gives here. It is a bright sun, the doctrine of justification by faith. It's a bright sunbeam coming down from heaven which lighteth, directeth, and guideth us. Now, like as the world with all its wisdom and power is not able to stop or turn away the beams of the sun coming down from heaven unto the earth, even so can there be nothing added to the doctrine of faith or taken from it. For that is an utter defacing and overthrowing of the whole. What's he saying? Larry, you following? <clears throat> yeah, you can't take away something of importance and substitute it with something that is not important 
or vice versa. Remove the important parts of Scripture and replace it with the unimportant. Yeah. You can't stop the truth. And so, we pray that God would enlighten us with uh, the Holy Spirit to cause us to understand. The truth is what it is. It reminds me of it. Sometimes I watch these guys play snooker and, uh, and the guy hits the white ball into the pocket, which is called a scratch. And this commentator, this guy's kind of funny. He says, the, po the pockets are always in the same place. <laughs> they don't move. <laughs> the reason why you hit it in the, in the pocket, the white ball, is you, you aimed off. Your aim was off. The truth is always the truth. And so it's, inc it's inc incumbent upon us to know what it is and to preach it. Okay, let's go to... Uh, back to question one. What is the chief end of man? And what's the answer? Garrett, give it to us. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We're back at question one. And we just mentioned the relationship between Psalm 1 and Galatians 5, 9. How about this? Same thing. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy. If you're off on this, you're off on everything. Now the next question, um, well, let's, let's start with this. The proof, th this question proves total depravity. Think about this proposition. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. How does this prove total depravity? Anybody got, anybody know where I'm going with this? Ethan, what do you think? Yeah, uh, God created man to have communion with him in the garden, and man was uh, objectively uh, accountable to God to glorify him in all his uh, doings. And we see in the world that men do nothing more than please themselves and to lust after the world and the things of the flesh. Uh, therefore, we see that all men are under the curse of God and uh, depraved in mind. Yes, but what I'm getting at is this. Um, how often do you hear people talk about the chief end of man? It's, it's something that you, could, you can live and die and never hear anybody talk about if, outside of the church. Which proves the depravity of man. I mean, we're going to get to the word end in a second. Number one, nobody naturally asks this question. Think about that. What's the chief end of man? Nobody asks the question. Secondly, the absolute necessity of asking the question. What are you here for? Have you ever seen, I've seen this from time to time. You'll see somebody on Facebook. They'll put up a picture and they'll say, so usually it's some kind of a tool. And they'll say, does anybody know what this is? <laughs> <laughs> and inevitably somebody will know what it is. But well, the importance of the question, Tom, you see the importance of the question? Hey, somebody gave me this. Does anybody know what this is? What's the importance of the question, Tom, if it's a tool? They want to know what it is in order to know what it's used for. <laughs> exactly. Because if you don't know what it is, then, then what? Can't use it. It's useless. You see where we're going with that? It's useless until you, un unless and until you know the purpose of it. Secondly, it implies that man has more than one use. What is the chief end of man? The chief, the primary, the main. For example, man can build, I mean, it's almost limitless. 
the things that man can accomplish, the, man, the things that man has accomplished. Build huge buildings, send people to the moon. If you're a mechanic, you can troubleshoot, find out what the, what's wrong with the motor, the engine. Man can cook great food. He can produce beautiful landscaping, paint beautiful pictures. Sort of like a screwdriver. You can use a screwdriver for a lot of things, right? But it has one main purpose. But man has an overriding, one overriding use. And without this use, all other uses are useless. That's what he's getting at. And that's what they're getting at with this first question. The chief end of man. The next thing we want to think about is what the word end means. The chief end of man. Jade, what does that word end mean? The uh, overall purpose. Right. The word end means purpose. The chief purpose. Look at Romans 10.4. So this is a good passage. To point this out. Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, this is, uh, this is sort of one of those multifaceted verses, but we can at least go this far to say that this word end can mean the same thing that it means in the first question of the catechism. Well, there's a chief end of man. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Everyone. In other words, Christ is the purpose of God's giving a law for righteousness to everyone that believes it. You, you follow it, Tom? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Yeah, it's, I know what you're saying, I'm just trying to think of how to articulate it, but um, Christ, the, the purpose of the law is for people who believe in Christ. Think of it this way, Tom. Christ gave us a law by which, well, this will help us, Ezekiel twenty eleven. Read that, Tom. Okay, and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. See it? Which is, if a man do, he shall live in them. So God gave us a law for righteousness, a law which, if kept, would result in you being a righteous man. But what was the purpose? You see what he's saying now. What was the purpose in God's giving us this law for righteousness, this law which if kept would end up in a person's being a righteous man? What was God's purpose, his end, in giving us that law for righteousness? And what's so the that answer? we can glorify him. No, he, he says Christ. Christ was the purpose of this law for righteousness. Oh. <laughs> of the giving of the law, see? Because the giving of the law, which if kept, would result in a righteous life. It can't be kept. And so, what's the end of that, Tom? Once a person realizes that God demands a righteousness which he cannot produce, then what happens? Then he realizes that well, he, he can't keep it, so Christ has to keep it. Right, forward. so he's driven to Christ. See, see how, what he's saying, Paul? Christ is the end. Christ is the The reason why God gave this law for righteousness, the Decalogue, is in order to drive the sinner to Christ. Christ was that end. Christ was that purpose. The chief end of man. And I was thinking, since we just finished with the uh, with prayer last week, 
Um, look at a question 101. What do we pray for in the first petition? The first petition, which is, hallowed be thy name. Listen carefully. We pray that God would enable us and others to glorify him in all that whereby he maketh himself known and that he would dispose all things to his own glory. So what is the chief end of man? What is the first petition in the Lord's Prayer? That God would enable us and others to glorify him in all that whereby he maketh himself known. To glorify God. And to enjoy him forever. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Jade, read that. And then therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Okay, you see it? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Listen to Flavel. A few questions from him. Question number one. Seeing a chief supposeth an inferior end. What is that inferior end for which man was made? This is really interesting. Listen to his answer. It was prudently, soberly, and mercifully to govern, use, and dispose of other creatures in the earth, sea, and air over which God gave man the dominion. Why is this so interesting? Because it overthrows what section of the church? Ethan, do you see it? Did it, did it pop up into your head? No, I'm not. A Christian Reconstructionist. Listen to it again. Oh, it was, I see. see yeah. It was prudently, soberly, and mercifully to govern the inferior in, to govern, use, and dispose of other creatures in the earth, sea, and air over which God gave man the dominion. They make that as the primary. It's, that's why it's called dominion theology. Genesis 126, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. But you see, without the chief end, as we said a couple of weeks ago, the last verse we read was out of Ecclesiastes. Without the chief end, all that is meaningless. Question two, what then is to be thought of these men who being wholly intent upon inferior... Hey, you think the guys, these reconstructions, these guys weren't around? What then is to be thought of these men who being wholly intent upon inferior things forget and neglect their principal end? 2 Timothy 5.1. Tom, read that. Don't tell me. <laughs> I didn't check it out. No second in the Bible. <laughs> okay, let me read the, the verse. Somebody can look it up if you got uh, Strong's. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. They have their portion in this life. Okay. So, once again, listen to the question. What then is to be thought of these men who being wholly intent upon inferior things forget and neglect their principal end? A statement. You've heard this before, right? And a good time was had by all. That's the extent of most people's life, right? That's their goal. A good time was had by all. Listen to this next one. How can man glorify God seeing he's perfectly glorious in himself? Great question, huh? How? You get it? How can man glorify God seeing he is perfectly glorious in himself? Answer. 
Man cannot glorify God by adding any new degree of glory to him. Look at Job 36. First Timothy. Huh? Yeah, first Timothy five six. Did you get it? Oh. Okay, um, What did I just say? Job what? 36.7. I got to check these things out. Double check them. Um, if thou be righteous. 36.5 and 6. Am I in the right place? It should be 35. Right, because I have memorized this verse, so I noticed that I noticed that the chapter was 35. Look under the heavens and see verse 5. 35, verse 5. Uh, Behold the clouds which are higher than thou. If thou sinnest, what thou what doest thou against him? Or if thou if thy transgressions be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? What's he saying? He says, service to offer yourself to God. Right. So what's he so it's the answer to this question. How can man increase the glory he can increase the glory of God since he's perfectly glorious in himself. In other words, well the word you know the word in Hebrew for glory literally means weight. Back in the uh, 70s and 80s when the hippies were around, you say something, somebody would say something profound and they'd say that's heavy, man. That's heavy. Uh, God is, God's glory is weight. Everything else is light. I think it's uh, Psalm 69.2 or 62.9. It says, man, to be laid in the balance is lighter than vanity. God is glorious. Weighty, something that is significant. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, one of our favorite passages. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we see this, the importance of this word glory. To give the light and the knowledge of the glory of God. What does that mean, Jay? That's salvation. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness in the physical creation and so it is in the spiritual creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge. What kind of light? Jay, what kind of light does he give us in salvation? Understanding of the truth. Uh, of the, but what does it say? The light of the knowledge of what? Glory the God. glory of God. So you discover, when you became a Christian, you discovered for the first time that it was God and not yourself who is to be glorified. Okay? That God's purposes are to be lived for. That God is the person. Whenever you do something, you do it for His purposes. So that people would... Psalm it's, it's, it's very closely related to what we have in Psalm 34. Verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You can't magnify God any, any greater than he already is. But it is to make God appear great and appear mighty and appear uh, magnified in the sight of men. 
Next question, wherein consists the enjoyment to glorify God and enjoy Him forever? Wherein consists the enjoyment of God? It consists first in the facial vision of Him in heaven. I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure any of you guys were around when, this was back when we were preaching from the Gospel of John. Did you ever listen to any of those sermons on the beatific vision? Well, there I must have had. How many of those, Ethan? Did you notice those? Yeah, there was six to eight of them, I believe. Yeah, the beatific vision. Listen to one or two of those sermons. It's a, what a, con, what, what a, a, uh, a source for meditation. The beatific vision. It consists first in the facial vision of him in heaven. Secondly, and he's talking about what it means to enjoy God. Secondly, in full conformity to him. First John 3, 2. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Thirdly, in that full satisfaction which results from both the former. Psalm 27, 15. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. But for some reason, I'm not sure why, but Flavel seems to be placing the emphasis on the eternal state of enjoyment of God. But uh, it's not limited to that. It's, it's, the, it's our life on earth. And what do we say about the five senses, uh, Tom? They're all what? They're, uh, they're all metaphors. Exactly. Choose. See, so you enjoy you enjoy the food you eat, um, the, the 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 touch of the smoothness of a new car or whatever it is, uh, the, the 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 sunset, the beauty of a sunset, etc. These all things are metaphors. The enjoyments in the physical life are all metaphors, something pointing to something outside of itself. Because apart from these metaphors, what does the physical realm have to offer us, Ethan? What does it have to offer us? Uh, nothing but sorrow and travail. Nothing at all. And once you realize how brief life is, what a contemplation. Next question. Can none enjoy him in heaven who do not glorify him on earth? No adult person can scripturally expect happiness in heaven without holiness on earth. So, that we go back to that bumper sticker. Don't be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. What do you think about that, Ethan? Don't be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. <laughs> yeah, there is no earthly good. <laughs> no earthly good. There is. It doesn't exist. In fact, if you're not spiritually minded, you're useless on earth. Next question. How comes the glory and enjoyment of God our chief end? How is, is what he's saying. How is the glory and enjoyment of God our chief end? He is our master and rightful owner and benefactor. We receive our being and preservation from him, of him and through him, and therefore to him be all things. Or in other words, the verse that we just looked at. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, if that's the purpose for which we are created, then that is what we are to be at. Next question: Do all men make God their? Do all men make God their chief end? No, they do not. Some make their sensual pleasure their chief end. Philippians three nineteen: Whose God is their belly? And some the world are chief in. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth and covetousness which is idolatry. What are the signs of a man's making himself his, making himself his chief in? Those make themselves their chief in who, who ascribe the glory of what they have or do to themselves. And not to God. Daniel 4, 30. Jay, read that one.
4.30? Yeah. The king spake and said, Is not the great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? There it is. See that? And that's just before... Guess what happened just after that? That's Nebuchadnezzar. He went out and God chased him out of, out of his throne, out of his kingdom, and he lived out in the, in the wild as an animal. Okay. What is the first truth inferred? What can we infer from this question and answer? Number one, that God hath dignified man above all other creatures on earth and giving him a capacity of glorifying God here and of enjoying him thereafter. So we're going to, in all these inferences or deductions, we're going to ask, how did he get this? This has helped, this helped us to learn how to think. How did he get this from the first question of the catechism? And she finished glorify God and join forever. Okay, first inference. That God hath dignified man above all other creatures on earth and giving him a capacity of glorifying God here and of enjoying him thereafter. Isn't that interesting? And he's, he's, he's basically, or they, are basically, or flavorless is saying, that this enjoying God forever is enjoying him hereafter. But we're saying that it, that it begins here. But anyway, how did he get that from that question? Tom, what would you say? How do you deduce this from the first question of the cat? Let me read it again. That God hath dignified man above all other creatures on earth and giving him a capacity of glorifying God here and of enjoying him there, hereafter. How do you get that? Tom? Because the question said it. <laughs> Come on, Tom. Yeah. You can come up with something better than that. Because <laughs> the question says, <laughs> Gary, this is this is wonderful <laughs> stuff. Trying to figure, see, trying to what we're doing. We're trying to climb into their heads, climb into Flavel's head. <clears throat> He's saying that the fact that they gave us this question, man, chief, and is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, tells us. That, hey, it, it, it's, it reminds me of what Luther said when, uh, what was it? He said, um, he said, don't muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. And Luther said, this is talking about paying your pastors. And somebody said to Luther, what do you mean it's talking about paying your pastors? It says nothing about paying your pastors. He says, well, it wasn't written for the oxen because they can't read. <laughs> so, what he's saying is this, that, hey, man is the only creature. What an honor we have that we can actively glorify God. Next inference. What is the second truth inferred hence? That the soul of man is not annihilated. Okay, I'm going to ask you, how do you get this from the question? That the soul of man is not annihilated by death, but advanced by it. Okay, how do you get that from the question? That the soul of man is not annihilated by death. In other words, we don't die like the animals. But we are advanced by death. How do you get that from the question, Jade? Would it be the origin of enjoying? It's the word. Somebody come up with it. Forever. <laughs> right? Because if you're going to enjoy God forever, you have to be living forever to do it forever. That's what they're saying. These guys teach you how to think. What's the third Truth inferred hence that it is the duty and wisdom of every Christian to renounce, deny, and forsake all inferior interests and enjoyments 
when they come in competition with the glory of God and our enjoyment of Him. I love this one. Let me read it again. And you tell me in a second how did he get this from the question. That it is the duty and wisdom of every Christian to renounce, deny, and forsake all inferior interests and enjoyments when they come in competition with the glory of God and our enjoying and our, and our enjoyment of Him. How did he get that from the text? Larry, you got it? I'm not sure. He's saying this. If it is true that our chief purpose in life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, then whenever an inferior purpose comes in con competition with this, we are to do what, Ethan? Uh, we're to renounce them. See that? Because they're not ultimately leading to God's glory. Yeah. Uh, it, going back to what we talked about in the uh, message today or, or last night, your time. The uh, parachurch organizations. What a, what, what a temptation that is. I'm going to start a parachurch organization. Of course I'm going to do it for the benefit of the church. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was never in question. But what? They're not really at the glory. How do we know? We can say that with confidence. How so, Ethan? I'm sorry, but we can say what with confidence? Yeah, yeah, okay, here's what, what, what I'm saying is this. The people that begin, that start parachurch ministries, every single one of them, 100% of them, do not do it for the glory of God. How can we say that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because... They have no warrant in Scripture. Yeah, they're not commanded. They're doing. It's not a command of God. So they are to renounce that idea. That idea flits around in your head. Oh, I could start a, a ministry on helping people how to understand Reformed theology. Helping people to know how to pray. Helping people to know how to witness. Get it out of your mind. Last inference. What is the fourth inference? Hence. That we are to abhor and renounce all those, listen to this one. We are to abhor and renounce all those doctrines and practices that debase the glory of God and exalt and magnify the creature. How many churches would, would does that get rid of? Owen. All of them? <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's just make it 99%. That we are to abhor and renounce all those doctrines and practices that debase the glory of God and exalt and magnify the creature. Any questions? I've got uh, just a brief comment. Five times. What's that, Tom? Go ahead, Go ahead Tom. <laughs> no, you uh, first. <laughs> <laughs> so, my, my question is, uh, reg I guess regarding the little leaven, or the little leaven leaven of the whole lump, how the little bit of like false doctrine can like ruin the whole gospel. So how does that, how does that work with Luther's belief in the Lord's Supper? Because he's wrong on that, so how does that work with, like, if he's wrong on that, it wouldn't, I mean, you know what I mean, like, how does that not well, work not, with everything else? Well, it's not, the answer to that is that it's not directly related to the gospel. What, the thing that we, the, the it's thing a, that, it's a, what's that, Ethan? It's a, a doctrine related to application. It's how the doctrine applies. Luther right. didn't uh, misapprehend the doctrine of the Lord's Supper itself. He simply misunderstood how it applied. 
Right. So it's more related to practice when it's an idea that has to do with practice and not the doctrine itself. But you see, Tom, when we're speaking of a little leaven, leavening the whole lump, and we're speaking of uh, walking in the counsel of the ungodly, we're speaking of di di directly of the doctrine. That's why we said Psalm 1 is the reason why Joseph Alexander said it's an excellent uh, introduction or... Uh, yeah, introduction to the Psalms as well as the whole of Scripture. Summary is the word he said. Yeah, excellent summary of, of, of the whole of the book of Psalms as well as Scripture is because it contains the gospel. So, you walking in the counsel of the ungodly with respect to an attack on the gospel itself. And a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. In the area of the gospel. I'll have to think about that. All right. What what was what was it you wanted to say, Ethan? Uh, just relating uh, the uh, question number one to Psalm one, in that uh, the chief end of man being to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Flavel brings out more um, expressively the end end that is the final end, the glorification of God in heaven. Um, but which is begun on earth, as Psalm 1 says, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. We now, in this life, walk, but with God. It's a, it's a daily putting away of the flesh um, and adhering to sound doctrine, which is part of our end. Our, our reason for being here is to glorify God on earth and, and to glorify Him in heaven. So just the relation between the two. Good point, and it just this thought just popped into my head. Why does he say? I, I was I was just a little confused at how, why he kept referring to enjoyment of God, eschatologically speaking. In other words, uh, as it relates only to heaven. And I think this is the answer that this is the way he took this question. Man's chief end. In other words, his final destination. See. The end of of his existence. I think more. I think he took it more uh, with the idea, the final, the final conclusion, uh, his chief end. He, it, the final outcome is to be able in heaven to fully and completely and sinlessly glorify God, because then and only then is there true. And perfect enjoyment of God. So I think that's that's what he was getting at in those statements about in the enjoyment of God being eschatological, being after this life. But one other thing I was going to try to point out, and that's that this first question is important because it describes the condition from which we have fallen. You see that? Because once again... The Westminster Shorter Catechism is a summary of the gospel. So, and, and, and look at the next question. What rule is God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy it? The word of God. And then, and so forth and so on. And you'll see they're working towards, they're working towards what happened. God created man, male and female, after his own image. And then the fall of man, but they're working towards something. They're starting off with the purpose of man, and that is the state from which man fell. And then comes in election and redemption and uh, regeneration and all the rest of the catechism, which is a summary of the gospel. But one of the prime reasons for the importance of this first question is this is the state from which we were fallen. Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, glorifying God and enjoying Him. That's the state from which they fell. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time together. We thank You for Thy Word and for this most important question that all of us uh, realize as a result of Thy Holy Spirit. Our purpose is to glorify Thee, that we no longer salvation is coming to the knowledge that it is not we ourselves that is to be that are to be glorified, but it is thyself. 
For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness is shining in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge that it is thee who is to be glorified in the face of Jesus Christ because we can't only glorify thee through Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the glorification of the Father except by me. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.